Bingo, four o'clock rock, Think Tech, Community Matters, uh, with Brett Obergaard from the School of Journalism at the School of Communications uh, at UH Manoa. Thank you for coming down, Brett. Thank you for having me again. Great to have you here. We can think and um, explore so many interesting issues with you about journalism and about the, the condition of the media and all that. And it seems like to me, and you know, we've covered news morphosis, I call it news morphosis, over the past mm, 10 years, but now we're in a different place. Now Donald Trump has changed it, and he has, he has <clears throat> in a funny way, may I say, he's attempted to use the latest technology in dealing directly with the people. You know, who needs media anyway? I have the power with my Twitter feed at 2 o'clock in the morning to tell them what I want. And I think that changes things, not only for him, but for his successors. Because now, once you establish that as a political culture point, it's going to happen. His future, future you know, campaign, uh, people campaigning for president, and for that matter, people in public office, are going to be irresistibly drawn to this, aren't they? Well, I think he has been in the right place at the right time. I don't think he, had, he did anything special except for exploited the technology that existed. And if there was somebody else in his role, he probably would have played out you know, in similar ways. Maybe not quite so, so dramatically, but um, yeah, it has changed the way we view politics. I think it's changed the way we view uh, civic engagement. I think it's changed the way we, we view the media, advertising, and just the whole game has uh, shifted. Yeah. because of this. We've seen something very dramatic happen due to social media, and this is a watershed moment. Yeah. Uh, you know, it seems like to me there's a convergence. You know, but people always talk about... Uh, Nate Smith used to run OC, uh, Oceanic Cable years ago, he was a, and he was, like, famous for discussing the whole possibility of convergence. And in that conversation, convergence meant the convergence of uh, television and computer, television and the Internet. And he saw that as a future thing. Um, you know, but actually, I think convergence is something else to me, and it goes beyond just, you know, we're having already convergence with, you know, the internet and television, it's all the same box already, uh, and you can get the same content on both boxes, that, that's happening, but what the convergence that I refer to is the convergence of fact and entertainment. <laughs> they become the same, or indistinguishable one from the other. An infotainment, if you will. <clears throat> I'm not sure, or uh, entertainment info. I'm not sure which comes first. I think most people see, uh, you know, I think people saw that campaign as, as, as a game, as entertainment, as better than the Sunday football, or at least as good, and they would be drawn magnetically and, and you know, locked onto it for days, for weeks, and they had to know everything that he said about everything, and he played on that brilliantly. It's, um, I w I'd like to say it's a new idea, but I think it's an old idea. And we, we have seen it before in demagogues earlier. <laughs> um, but um, don't you agree that it's indistinguishable between, say, Madam Secretary, one of my favorite shows, or at least it was when it started, okay, and, and, and studying, you know, what's happening in the State Department, what's happening in the world. And, and they follow, they follow the events in the world. So you begin to get confused, don't you, about what's, are they telling you accurately what's happening out there in diplomatic relations, or, or is that fiction? But it sounds yeah, like fact. I mean, we just have, we have a whole uh, bunch of different things happening all at once, and uh, there are historical precedents. I mean, if you look back at the Penny Press, that's where I always go, go back to where journalism changed dramatically by introducing advertising and large circulations, large audiences to make a dollar. Uh, the commercialization of the media really has um, affected it dramatically, and now we're seeing the fruits of that. But then we also, um, I think one thing that sort of snuck up on me was the John Stewart and Stephen Colbert and that um, genre of... Rachel uh, Ma Ma Maddox, is her name? Uh, Ma Rachel Maddow. Maddow. But, well, I'm thinking more of the comedians. Okay. <laughs> and how they um, basically turn the news into entertainment, and at first it was kind of novel, and then it became normalized. And pretty soon, like you said, you can't distinguish between news and entertainment. And I don't think uh, that's changed since the election. I think people are still picking up their uh, mobile devices and checking to see what Trump did today. And uh, a lot of times it's just some, some means of distracting from what's really happening behind the scenes. Yeah, a cover. 
is what we have. Well, uh, if you've ever seen the musical Chicago, or read the book, or, or uh, read the play, you uh, know that that was, you know, something that's hundred hundred years ago. That the, the dazzly objects in the in the public's eyes will distract them while nefarious things happen. So have, you have a great uh, stress point. I mean, we had just uh, last hour. We had the communications director of the city and county, and I asked them, you know, <clears throat> we we have changes in the media now. We have changes in journalism. We have changes in the way we consume news, how does that affect you as communications director? It make, makes it harder. Makes it harder. We have to get through that. Well, it, uh, it's, convergence is a good word for it. And then when we talk about convergence, we used to talk about, uh, like even a few years ago with the mobile device, how the mobile device converged all our other, other media forms. But there's also a convergence culture, which means that basically all the cultures that used to be separated by the different mediums have also been blended and uh, kind of mixed together. And that's created this weird swirl as well that people are still trying to pick apart. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I mean, this is something you and I have talked about before. This all, if you assume the First Amendment is a core, you know, constitutional point, and I think we do, uh, and if you assume that it, it's necessary for the public not only to be well informed, but also well engaged in, you know, public affairs, um, we do. I think it's, it's part of the founding fathers' concept, vision of how this country would work. But it's been mm, depreciated, uh, deprecated over the past few years, it seems to me. We live in a time when that's a visible, you know, evolution. It's visibly happening. And the public is not so well informed. The public is, mm, mm, more often than not, it's, it's, it's vulnerable and victimized by people who would give it a line instead of the facts. And where can you get, you know, you and I have talked about the burden on the citizen to mm -hmm. inform himself or herself. Mm -hmm. It's hard, and it's harder. No, it's really hard. It's in, in fact, for most yeah. people with their education, it's too hard. Or without the interest. I mean, to me, it's like, okay, if I, get a, if I see 100 stories on social media today, how many of those am I going to spend an hour tracing back to the original source? I just can't do it. So at some point, you have to trust your feeds or trust uh, you know the person who posted it or whatever it is and then the more you trust and extend that ladder the, the more likely you are to uh, be tricked yeah and and social media we, we talked about this earlier has resulted in the accentuation of bubbles mm -hmm. you and I live in a bubble uh, I don't think we should call ourselves the elite because the elite is only <laughs> is only on the East Coast, I think. But we sh we should you know we treat ourselves at least people for some part of our lives. We cared a lot about education and being up on things and all that. Um, and yet our bubble is an incomplete bubble. Bubbles by definition are incomplete. Mm -hmm. You're you live in a bubble. You don't know what's outside the bubble. And I and I, your point and I take it is that is that we have not been sensitive to what's outside the bubble. We talk to people who agree with us on most points and therefore, you know, we, uh, we are fooling ourselves. <laughs> well, the technology has enabled us to live in the bubbles in ways that we couldn't before. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago, uh, the nightly newscast would come on and everybody would hear the same three people say, this, say the homogenized news. And there were flaws in that. <laughs> But that said, at least everybody was uh, on common ground in terms of what they heard and what they believed in. Now, I mean, you can really live in completely different universes where uh, you will never cross paths with the same information as, as the person in the other bubble. And that can be very scary because uh, I really don't believe that there's uh, an evil empire out there brewing. I believe there's a, a people who understand the world in a different way than, than uh, me or maybe other people. And those people are well-meaning. They want a good life. They want to raise their families. They want to have their job. They have all these uh, noble goals. But, but they um, have been disconnected from the rest of the folks who have different viewpoints. Yeah. So does that, does that create a burden on the people in one bubble to look across the way into the other bubble? I think I mean, so. If we wanted to be uh, really absolutely. sensitive, yeah. we would look, wouldn't we? Well, one of the uh, primary exercises I do in, in uh, introductory classes is just have people listen to all the different media perspectives. 
so we identify, okay, what's a left-wing channel, what's a centrist channel, what's a right-wing channel, locally or regionally, and then also internationally, because uh, it's really an amazing exercise if you look at an international news event and you only look at American media sources and then suddenly you look at um, how European or Chinese or Australian or whatever, how they see the same news event, it's, it's, it's another example of a bubble like we don't even uh, comprehend how another country could see this. Yeah. And it can be very shocking and so the, I know this, the students I put through that exercise have, have, have gained a lot from it. And I gain a lot from it every time uh, I even um, work with students on it, because it is mind-boggling to to imagine these um, these ideas that you never even knew existed that are out there, and held forcefully by and somebody. held forcefully like gospel. Yeah, well, you know, it reminds me of the whole notion of um, if you if you go, for example, to a country like Vietnam and get into the, all the mangle we got into over there. At the end of the day, the people. The, the U.S. became more sensitive to their bubble, mm -hmm. and they became more knowledgeable and presumably sensitive to our bubble, and now we have common ground. At least we have exposure to it. And I have felt, wrongly I think, but I have felt that this could happen in the Middle East as well, is that we, we're there, they know who we are, they, they know what we're made of, and presumably they, they can feel better about us. And we know more about what they are. They're not the evil empire, they're just people. And, we can, you know, look into their bubble and feel better. I, I'm not sure that's working, by the way. <laughs> but, but, but well, know, the propaganda is very difficult to overcome. Gets in the way. It gets yeah. in the way, and uh, it perpetuates. So it, it 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 says in a word that the you know bubbles part of a bubble. I'd love to describe it. Part <laughs> of the bubble is you tell the people in the bubble they should not look at the other bubble. That the other bubble is all wrong, and they should stay where it's comfortable in our bubble. That's part of well, being in a bubble. I, yeah, I mean, you can look back uh, historically to uh, the allegory of Plato's cave, if you're familiar with that. Basically, the idea is that there are people underground chained to a wall, and all they can see is their reflection from a fire behind them, and so they sh see shadows. One day, one person escapes, climbs out of the cave, and says, there's this whole world out here, you know, uh, come check it out, and everybody won't believe them because they're just... They just see the shadows and think that's reality. There it is. And that's a 2,000-year-old story that's still, <laughs> still true works. today. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I worry about it because I'm, I think that actually my bubble, I believe my bubble, I can see the other bubble now. I mean, I've, I've been shaken by this <laughs> election, election, but I can see it more clearly now. And the question really is, can they see my bubble or are they all mad at me? Well, or, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a matter of desire. Do they want to? And I'm not convinced right now that anybody's in the mood for seeking common ground. I think it's um, been framed rhetorically as a winner-take-all type election. And one group has won that election, and, and uh, they're pretty much intent right now, as far as I can tell, on claiming the spoils of the victory. The spoils of the victory. What a perfect way to put it. I'm going to have to contemplate that for exactly <laughs> one minute. We're going to take a short break. Okay. Brent Obergaard, assistant professor at the, um, at the journalism program in the community at UH Manoa, and we're ruminating about how it, the world is changing around us, especially in the media. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna, and I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, the Politics in Hawaii series. Join us each week as we have guest after guest talking about the policy and the politics of our state, of our islands, and of what really matters to each of us. So please, join us each week and engage in that conversation. Mahalo. Hey, how you doing? Uh, welcome to Abachi Talk. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm your co-host. And we have a nice program here every Friday at 1 o'clock uh, on Think Tech Studios where we talk about technology and we have a little bit of fun with it. So join us if you can. Thanks. Aloha. All right. We're back. We're live with Brent Obergaard. And we're talking about, you know, his personal journey on this thing. <laughs> 
You know, for a month or two or three ago, life was different. The way you perceive things, the way a professor of journalism would perceive things is different now. And he's coping with this. Talk about it, will you? Uh, well, I just, I just think that um, possibilities have arisen in the world that I just couldn't imagine uh, two months ago or one month ago. And for example, the Canadian government recently held an exercise uh, to imagine what their country would be like if their two largest newspapers folded and how that would affect their information systems and everything. And so I started to think, like, what, happened? what would happen if New York Times and the Washington Post just suddenly disappeared? And it's not, without, it's not outside the realm of possibility at all. Um, in fact, uh, I, like I said, a month ago I would have thought no possibility. Now I think uh, it's certainly possible. When you say folded, do you mean folded or get crushed I by mean, government? Well, whatever happens disappears. Yeah. And the, the drill was what happens if these big Canadian newspapers just are gone? How does the information system change? And uh, when you reflect upon the New York Times, not only their original reporting that people get firsthand, but then the secondhand ripples of every news organization that responds to the New York Times, including the Washington Post. Uh, I mean, to me, it would, I, I don't know, I was just kind of shaken by that thought. I've always been appreciative of the New York Times, but more now than ever before. Oh, yeah. They stand as the beacon. They stood as the beacon during the campaign, and they, they continue to, you know, serve the public in r tremendous ways. Yes, and they're taking a beating financially. I mean, they're down, uh, I don't remember the latest number, something like 7 10%. In uh, circulation? Uh, or in stock in price? Stock price. Mm -hmm. And um, if you think of the regional newspapers that used to provide a lot of great content, and Pulitzer Prize winning work, a lot of those have shriveled up lately. And like my uh, hometown paper, The Oregonian, used to be one of the greatest newspapers in the country and now it is uh, really struggling and, and it would not it would not be uh, what well, you would consider a beacon of anything <laughs> no oh. criticism to them but um, that's the kind of folding up of the journalism tents that scares me and then on the other side of that we have what has been known recently over the last few weeks as fake news oh. this is very chilling also fake news the kind the kind that contaminates all news as potentially fake yeah, uh, fake news is very troublesome because not only does it mislead people directly, it erodes the trust in the real news. And uh, I have the, this big fear that um, pretty soon nobody will believe anything, nothing will be valid, and then in that kind of world, uh, there are no checks on power and uh, corruption runs rampant. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, I give you the ghost of Christmas future. Since we're coming on to Christmas and Charles Dickens wrote uh, The Christmas <laughs> Carol and talked to it about Scrooge's view into the ghost of Christmas future where he was threatened by what he saw, changed his ways maybe. Um, so, the, so if I take the New York Times out and I take the Washington Post out, uh, you have a huge deflation in credibility, a further deflation in credibility and in original reporting. Uh, and then I have the prospect of fake news coming from everywhere. What happens to our society? Uh, before you get to the question of government, what happens on the daily life of the person who consumes news uh, or who, who is simply living in, in our society? What happens? Well, I used to have the uh, fear of the zombie apocalypse, but now I have this fear <laughs> of the New York Times, you know, obliteration <laughs> in what the world would be like. And I think we already can see it with um, what most people consume in news each day. They have uh, pictures of lunches, they have cats on the internet, they have whatever will distract them from what's really happening. And that's my biggest fear is that I, we talk about civic engagement, people will completely become detached from uh, the inner workings of the of the government and uh, suddenly those those folks in, in government can do whatever they want and maybe the people wouldn't approve of that if they knew. You keep referring to government, but before we get to government, what about our daily lives? What about, well, I don't know, knowing what happens on the block, um, knowing about um, things that are more in the gossip column than, than are in government? Uh, well, we've already had a uh, crisis across the country in what's called uh, news deserts where small dailies and weeklies have folded up and you'll have 
a, a swath of the country, maybe hundreds of miles with no original news source, zero. Not a newspaper, not a radio station, not a television station. And um, these, if you imagine, uh, say the, say the uh, gr infographics of Africa drying up with the water, get, you know, like getting more and more parched, that's what our country is becoming in terms of its news, um, uh, news circles. The word isolation comes to mind. I'm on my block, something happens on the other block, I have no idea about it, I'm isolated. Well, and isolated from any that. information about their community. Yeah, right. any kind of any kind of uh, journalistic information where somebody actually asks tough questions of city councilors or um, business you're, you're owners. You're government again, but well, but what no, about, I'm saying the journalists asking those okay. in these news deserts. But what about what about my, the quality of my life, not knowing what's happening on the next block, the news desert, as you call. It. Um, how does how does that affect my life? Uh, uh, oh, we become like in a place like Hawaii, we'd become so isolated. We'd become uh, incredibly isolated from yeah. from the mainland uh, interests. Yeah. Uh, because who would report it? I mean, you have to think like who would replace the New York Times or Washington Post? Uh, I can't think of any <laughs> any any entity that would do that. I mean, fake may, news, fake news. yeah, we would have. Uh, you know, the some somewhat of the television stations. You'd have occasional bureau reporters, but uh, I think the Washington Post originally put a dozen reporters on Trump's campaign. A dozen people full time covering his campaign. Where would you get something like that from? It wouldn't. It would. It would just. If uh, they went away, then he would be able to do a lot more with impunity. Yeah, and at least we know what's happening. I mean, we may not be able to to respond to it in any way. Like oftentimes, as a as a citizen here in Hawaii and you're in a, in a kind of a one-party state, you don't really feel like anything you can do politically matters. And I think that is, a, you know, somewhat of a, a challenging position to be in. But that said, at least you feel like, you know, emotionally you can respond to it, whether it's ranting on your Facebook page or whatever it is. Yeah. You can do something about it. Yeah. Uh, and. In, in, in that kind of scenario, I think, I think you would feel even more isolated and more powerless. What I'm getting here, though, is that the major effect of getting news, of getting good news, of, of getting, you know, hard news, is the relationship of the citizen and government. Mm -hmm. It's nice to know when they're having a sale at the grocery store, but that's not important relative to who's governing us, who is setting the governmental standards, who, who has the power, both physical and, and uh, economically, over us? And that's really, uh, you were, you've been getting at that, and I'm resisting it till the end now. <laughs> but well, that's really what we're talking about. Well, it's that, a watchdog of not only government, but of, of power and uh, business, I think, is something that people don't often think about with journalism. But journalism keeps a watch on businesses of all, all types, and, uh, you know, from pollution to poor... Uh, employment practices to you know uh, 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 firing people or whatever it is we we know what's happening and then that that knowledge affects you know potentially what you would do in terms of uh, helping the business or patronizing the business or whatever yeah but if you lose that then suddenly you know Walmart uh, paying two dollars an hour nobody even knows knows yeah. about or something you become a victim we all become victims yeah so now, the, the bottom line question, the question that really counts here now that we have a new president who has a different approach to all of this and who likes to do direct tweets at 2 o'clock in the morning and stir things up without regard to the media at all, direct media, if you will, um, how does this, how does he, how does this entertainment info kind of confusion, how does this affect the relationship of the citizen and the government? This is the scariest question of all. Well, number one, it's a broadcast medium. He's not uh, responding to people on Twitter unless it's a, a, a chance to kind of reinforce his message. So with journalism, you have a person in the room asking questions that, the, you know, in the, in the place of the public, you know, asking critical questions. In, in, uh, in this direct access, there are no questions. It's just a propaganda machine. And I'm not uh, trying to... to uh, drum up some kind of s scary situation it's just the truth of it is you get the message and you can do with it what you want but you can't uh, in any way respond to it 
like a journalist could, especially a journalist in the room that can ask the person about, like, why did you say that? What did you mean? Um, what are the details behind this? Like, I'm going to build a wall. Well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> you know, who's going to pay for it? How's it going to be paid? Who's going to, you know, so there's all these things that the journalist does for the citizen that um, just can never be replicated on social media. Oh, it's true. And, and uh, I'm reminded that uh, the last time Donald Trump had an actual press conference was back in July, and that he hasn't had one since. He's been speaking without the opportunity for the press or anyone to really it's always in the news. Yeah. And this is not just uh, Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton did the same thing. And that's why I said, uh, I think Trump has given this um, prestige as figuring this thing out. I think it's really a matter of him being in the right place at the right time. He does have some talent for it, no doubt, but uh, Hillary ran the same kind of um, one-way street, one-way transmission messaging very little access to reporters and uh and i think that's dangerous for everybody i yeah. mean in my mind the the public official should be available at any time anybody wants to ask them about something yeah but the reality though is that here on both sides of this campaign they've done this on both sides of this campaign they have not they have avoided interaction mm -hmm. and they have done one-way streets and the likelihood is that in the future this will be a political culture point for the united states uh, and maybe elsewhere too. They're setting a new standard. So my question for you, this is a hard one. We only have a minute to answer it. <laughs> Sorry. I'll try. So what's what's gonna happen here? We, we've seen, you know, I, I know it's hard because w everything's changing and it's hard to get a bead on, you know, a, a trajectory. But what do you think, at least at this moment here in late November of 2016, what's gonna happen? Well, I can tell you my fear. My fear is that we'll lose more and more uh, confidence in journalists and news until the, ho the whole system basically goes down. And it's not going to be uh, an easy thing to rebuild. It'll be very, very difficult to rebuild. And citizen journalists won't do it. I love what citizen journalists can do, but they can't um, replace, you know, a thousand uh, full-time professional journalists covering the president or something like that. And um, I don't really see any way that this is going to turn around in the, anytime soon, at least in the next four years. Um, so that's, that's my fear. Where it goes after that, I don't know. I mean, I think there are a lot of digital media organizations emerging that are doing great work. Um, locally, we have Civil Beat, we have um, ProPublica on the national scale. We have a lot of um, very exciting, interesting news organizations emerging. But, um, you know, can they fill that void? Can they sustain um, the, the pressure that's on the system? I don't know. I have an idea, Brett. We should get together on a regular basis. <laughs> okay. And make sure that we do what we can to protect the public republic. I hope so, yes. Let's do it. <laughs> Take care of them. Right over there. <laughs>